Let's me to airlines. Now, this Rex um, business that uh, uh, we've all kind of had to observe, live through, um, I don't know what it is about airlines at third airline in Australia. It just seems to be incredibly difficult for it to stay viable. I put a call in to Bruce Dale, uh, and Tony's just noticed that his... Um, Telephone number is an aer- aeroplane, is it? 787? I've got a 787. A 787? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe that's just a coincidence. Bruce, are you there? I certainly am, Jeremy, and it is no coincidence. I did choose a number with 787 in. <laughs> oh, well, God bless you. Uh, now, you're an aviation expert. You're the one uh, who maybe has the uh, the keys to the kingdom, the secret. I Last <laughs> last night, knowing I was going to talk to you, I, I googled um, how many airlines in Australia have gone bankrupt, and I could not believe the list. Mind you, it did go back to uh, um, Butler Airways, but there have literally been hundreds of, of startups that have never, ever succeeded. What is the problem? It's not just an Australian problem. I, I'm, I'm an aviation lifelong enthusiast, and I've got a little plane spotting book from 1984, which had all the airlines of the world listed. And I had a little look, and pre-COVID, 95% of them had either gone bankrupt or had required a buyout or support by the state in some form. Wow. It is an absolutely terrible business to be in. There's a saying that goes, how do you make a small fortune in the airline industry mm-hmm. is make a big fortune somewhere else and then <laughs> go into this mug game. <laughs> uh, well, in a country like Australia, um, which would have to be a country made for, for mm-hmm. air travel, it's just so big. Uh, is it the population? We, we don't have enough people yet to support that third airline? We do. It's it's the nature of where Australians live. We we have a big population, we're thinly spread, and most of us live in the big capital cities. So really we've got about four or five cities which generate a vast proportion of the Australian passenger travel. I mean, people might have heard of the saying the Golden Triangle for those mm. flights between Sydney, Brisbane and Melbourne. Yeah. And then you've got the rest of the population which is thinly spread. I mean, I know that. I, I live in Darwin and I'm often flying for hours and hours across this great vast country of ours. And yeah. that poses particular challenges. First of all, it is higher cost. Australia has some of the longest sectors in the world for domestic flying. Um, and it's also difficult because it's a game of volume. Um, we have large passenger volumes, but to get the scale of efficient operations, it seems like it's difficult to crack that third airline on the major city routes. Um, what about prices? Uh in the sense that uh, if you've got competition, you should have lower prices. But there's a point, obviously, when the prices get so low, they just won't sustain the business. They don't. Um, I, I'm a boring sack, and some things I've done in my free time is actually look at the Qantas annual reports for decades. And what comes clear is actually the revenue airlines earn from passenger tickets doesn't actually cover their cost of operations. They need extra money from cargo, freight. Um, back in the 70s, it was hotel and maintenance services. Today, it's frequent flyer revenue. So you actually need more than passengers to break even, if not make a profit. That's how tenuous the, the airline business is. So that's the challenge is what do you do if you're in an industry where your core market isn't actually covering your costs? That's why prices are very sensitive. You have a few people who pay below fare, they, below the cost of the operation, and they need to be offset by a few passengers paying a much higher rate, which typically a business class or those last-minute fares. As a business that is so fraught with uh, difficulties and dangers, why is it so attractive that people keep trying? Oh, it gets in the blood. You you like the challenge. I mean, what's life without a good challenge? It's also <laughs> it's, the, it's romantic too, in a sense, isn't it? It is. It is. You you take on a whole new perspective when you you look at the world from the you know from above. Um, it is um, it's challenging. It's operationally complex. You have to be on top of your game on many different areas. And I think there's that um, sort of that aviation 
daring spirit. Um, for example, British Airways' motto is to fly to serve. I think anyone in the aviation industry feels that on a personal level. We are in the job of flying aeroplanes, but more importantly, we're in the job of connecting people, and that's very important. And that's what Rex did really well, particularly connecting the regional centres. What does Rex stand for? Rex uh, um, Regional? It was, it was Regional Express. Regional Express. So, oh. Yes. It actually formed out of the subsidiaries of ANSET when that went bust in 2001. Yeah. And when they were doing their regional operations um, 10 years ago, they were winning awards as a, an incredibly good airline for operations, but also profitability. They were judged to be the world's most second most profitable on a return of investment. So the Rex team do actually know how to run a profitable airline. It's just when they went to scale up, took the opportunity um, to enter the trunk routes um, with the potential collapse of ANSET, that things maybe went a little awry for them. But this uh, entry recently uh, mm. into the Sydney, Melbourne and Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane uh, area, mm -hmm. th that was the fatal step, I gather. Yes. The cost of operating jets is very significant. Um, it's a very competitive market um, in terms of people are often locked into their frequent flyer programs. And if you're a traveller and Rex offers maybe two or three flights a day and you're competing with Virgin or Qantas, who could be offering up to 20 flights a day, sometimes it's difficult to justify the choice of changing your loyalty or just trying out Rex. They were losing, I believe, a million dollars a week? Something like that. It's uh, been reported. Of course, that will all come through in the wash once the um, administrators release their findings. But that is not an unsurprising amount in the airline industry. So what happens now? It's, uh, it's a viable regional airline, mm -hmm. but it's not, it, 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 it just can't play with the big boys. But to be, why not just be happy with your patch? It's opportunity. I mean, it was COVID. Um, like any business, you, you've got to grow and change and try opportunities. Mm. And at the, if you remember back in the, the those dark days of 2020, Virgin was in administration. It was uncertain if it was actually even going to keep flying. So Rex wanted to use that opportunity to fill the space which could have been potentially vacated by Virgin. Do you think anybody will come in and have another go at that third airline situation? What we've got is we've got conditions which are improving the potential for a third airline. We've got extra runway capacity coming on in Melbourne, and there will be the Western Sydney Airport opening as well. Yep. I think they will be key to unlocking the potential for competition in Australia. Uh -huh. Will it be an Australian who does it, or will it be a... I don't know if uh, foreign airlines are allowed in, are they? Uh, what Australia has, it's actually one of the most liberal aviation policies mm -hmm. in terms of foreign airlines can't basically come in and fly, but foreign capital can. Um, the only Australian-owned airlines that I'm aware of are mm -hmm. uh, Nexus in Northwest Australia and the Qantas Group. Just about every other airline in Australia um, is actually foreign-owned. So we're very liberal. I remember some time ago there was a discussion about allowing the... Uh foreign airlines that fly into Australia to pick up domestic passengers mm -hmm. and fly them from one city to another. But there was a great kerfuffle among those stakeholders here. They didn't want that sort of competition. But would that be a healthy thing to do or not? We've got different elements at play. I mean, I, I think as, a, as an aviation worker, it would be difficult to justify why I should be competing with someone who's earning foreign wages or potentially having um, foreign work conditions, which would be illegal in Australia, for yeah, example, yeah, yeah, firing yeah, yeah, women yeah, who yeah. are pregnant and everything like that. Yeah. Also, if you actually look at the numbers, the Australian airlines aren't necessarily inefficient airlines. Um, on a seat kilometre basis, Australian airlines often come out as very efficient by world standards. Um, one reason we have higher fares is simply because we fly so much farther than average. Yes. I mean, the stat that I use is when I fly up to Darwin, is that flight is actually longer than 95% of all the other flights flown in the world. So we are actually often in that top cohort of distance flown on compared to world averages. And you can't fly longer without having higher costs. Back in the day when you had... Uh uh, ANSET and TAA, 
And that seemed to work really well. It was very regulated, almost to the point where people would say, well, why can't they, they stagger uh, the the airline takeoffs so that... Uh, mm. Well, why do we have Qantas or, or ANSET and TAA taking off at the same time? Why do we do that? That, that I, was certainly many years ago when it was extremely regulated. Yeah. It was called the two airline policy. I yeah. know I was in but, uh, but North it, Queensland what, what, what and I'm, we'd have. What I'm saying is it worked. Sites, yeah. it, it did work though, didn't it? Everyone seemed to make a profit. Everyone got to where he or she wanted to go eventually and preferably yeah. with their luggage. Oh, they they <laughs> certainly did. But the fares were horrendous. I, I was just looking at some fares. I did some inflation adjustment. Like um, at the moment, I can fly between Darwin and Sydney for $300. Hmm. Back in the day, it would have been nearly $1,600 in today's Yeah, fare. I see. You know, it's the I cheapest see. fare. So although it worked for the few who were traveling, it didn't enable mass travel, which comes through business efficiencies, different business models, and a degree of healthy competition. I see. I see. I agree. Uh, has Qantas uh, repaired its uh, reputation or are they still uh, in uh, uh, crisis mode? Oh, I, I, I think it's like any company which has been through a bit of a battering. Um, it takes um, – uh, you can lose your business reputation very quickly and it takes yeah. a long while to gain it back. Yeah. Um, they are, a, from my perspective as a traveller, I've – experience the up and downs over many years like any airline yep. and they're a good representation of australia and i wish them well in re recovering in, in the same way that virgins actually come back from being on the brink as well they, it's, well, uh, they, it's they great were, to see australians succeed yeah. yeah they were on the brink i think they called in the the, the receivers or something didn't they in, they certainly were yeah. in um they they did almost closed down during the COVID period. Yeah. Um, of course, they were bailed out by Bain Capital. What's the best airline in the world? And then I'll let you go. Oh, it depends. It's very subjective. Um, I'm very patriotic. I do like the Australian Airlines, Qantas, Virgin. They, they give wonderful service, um, my, my style of service, and they, they keep me connected to family. So that is why, my perspective, they're the best airlines in the world. Thanks for talking with us, Bruce. No worries. Thank you, Jeremy. No, very good to talk to you. Bruce Dale.